Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Opapari, and this is the Songwriters on Process podcast. Since 2010, I've been interviewing songwriters about their writing process. And on this podcast, we go deep, deep, deep into the writing process, far deeper than the usual. Do you start with the lyrics or the music question? Uh, by way of background, I have a PhD in English literature, and I'm a prose writer myself. I'm not a songwriter. In fact, I've never written a song in my life. Uh, but my goal is has always been to treat songwriters the same way that we treat prose writers and poets, just as writers, plain and simple, and have always been interested in the writing process. This is an intelligent conversation between two writers. And on this podcast, like I said, we go deep into the process. We talk about rituals, the seeds of inspiration, the role of movement on the process, writer's block, the revision process, pens, pencils, types of paper, and of course, we talk about books. You can find all the archived interviews on the Songwriters on Podcast website and across all streaming platforms. And with that, let's dive into this week's episode. And today we have Eric Early of Blitz and Trapper. Uh, Blitz and Trapper has a new album out. It is called 100s of 1000s, Millions of Billions. It's out May 17 on Yep Rock Records. Um, the title comes from Early's fascination with Buddhist texts and meditation. We talked about meditation during the podcast and the importance that meditation has on this process. So that's where the title comes from. Again, it is called 100s of 1000s, Millions of Billions, out May 17 on Yep Rock Records. So I want to correct myself in the podcast. Um, I mentioned we talked about Jennifer Egan's book, Candy House, and I think I mentioned that Candy House was a prequel to her book, Visit from the Goon Squad. And uh, Candy House by Jennifer Egan is not a prequel. It is a sequel to Egan's book, Visit from the Goon Squad. And I think I, I actually got the title of that book wrong as well. Anyway, I just want to clear that up. So this is my second time interviewing early. Uh, I think the last time was 2017 or so. So it's always fun to do these interviews a few years later and update the answers. Uh, last time we talked, he mentioned that he was always writing. I think he was working on five novels that if you go back to the, to the interview, I think he said he was working on five novels or he'd finished five novels. Things are different now. He has a child. He doesn't write, doesn't feel the need to write as often as he did. Last time we talked, he felt that compulsion to write. He was always, always, always writing. Um, not so much anymore. We had a good discussion about writing, about reading, sorry. And he talked about what he calls the time of the tomes. He even gave it a title where he was reading just nothing but long books, the long iconic books, War and Peace, uh, you know, all of the big books from literature. Um, and that's what he was, he was reading as a voracious, he's a voracious reader, as you can tell. Um, Dream journals are also a very big part of his process, and we discussed that as well. I love that he says, I, I, this is a great interview, but I love what he says. We talked about when ideas come to us when we're not expecting them, and he mentioned how when he was in college, he'd be working on these really advanced math problems, and he could not solve them, but they would come to him when he was making breakfast, and that's within the context of ideas coming to us when we're not expecting them. Um, so we talked a lot just about reading and writing in the process. I love at the end of the podcast, we both agreed. We talked about a love of the book, uh, uh, all the light we cannot see by Anthony door. And we both agreed that the line wedges of wet sunlight from Anthony, from the, from all the light we cannot see is one of our favorite lines in literature. I'm so glad to finally have someone to talk about that with wedges of wet sunlight. And we talked, spent a couple minutes talking about why that line is so important, what it means, the depth, the sounds, all that stuff that's towards the end, but make sure you stick around for that. So with that, my interview with Eric early of Blitz and Trapper. Here's what I want to start with, um, and that is looking back at our interview uh, uh, we did in 2018. You mentioned Brees DJ Pancake as one of your favorite writers. And at that point, I think enough songwriters had told me about him that I said, you know, I finally have to read this guy. And I and yeah. so I finally went out and read his book. 
and it's unbelievable. Um, you know, I don't know if you read the article in the New Yorker about him. Um, I think a few years ago is after our conversation, but you know, his backstory was that he wrote that one book and then committed suicide. He was in his twenties, but he was heralded it as like, you know, the next great American writer. He was, I think called the hillbilly Hemingway. Um, mm -hmm. so once you mentioned that, I, I said enough people had met enough songwriters had mentioned him. So I love that. So <laughs> thank you very much. Cause I, I, I'm blown away by how good of a writer he, um, he is. So I normally went to the end to talk about writing or, or writers, but uh, who should I be reading now? Who who are some <laughs> of your favorite writers? I mean, you 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 didn't you you, you led me down the right path last time. So um, <laughs> and I know you're I know you're a voracious reader. So uh, who are some of your favorite authors that you've been reading now? And, and I also want to say this really quickly that you there's two things that see you have no idea the impact you had on me you also said that you read three books at a time each one from a different genre and i, yeah, I started do doing that, that yeah conversation um and i could and it's always has to be i i've done three a few times um i normally do two but they have to be different genres so i love that you told me that too so you have this is the influence you had on me so with all of that Pray, you know, uh intro yeah let's talk books straight off the bat okay yeah man i don't know what have i been into lately i think man 2018 that seems like another life ago um yeah i got into this thing during covid where uh i call it the time of the tomes and I just started reading massive books. And I started with War and Peace. I think I read that in 2020. And then I moved from there to um, a bunch of sort of Victorian and pre-tomes. And it's been a while, and I'm trying to remember exactly what all I read. But I was just reading these really big books. Um, I think I read... Gosh, it's been a while now. What made you decide the tomes? I what? I don't well, know. First of all, I just yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I I think. Oh yeah, and then I read like Les Mis. I I just read all the class these classic massive books, you know. And and I think it was. I think there was a desire in me to get into something that would just last forever, theoretically, <laughs> you know. And I also, in 2019, started working a day job. Um, and so I didn't have as much time to read. And so I kind of just started these giant books and would just do like 10 pages a day and just let them spread out over months to where I just really felt like I was in that book so deeply. <laughs> and it was an experience I had only done once before when I read Infinite Jest, probably in 2013 or something where I just got so deep into that and was reading it slowly on a tour, on a bus tour that I just felt like my mind was just like always there. And so I kind of wanted that experience, but I kind of got addicted to it. And so I started reading Dickens and all these massive books that I had never really touched before. Cause I'd always been into the sort of uh, like uh, pancake or Hemingway, you know, these guys who are like really succinct icebergers that just like, uh the writing just flows you know like really seamlessly cormac mccarthy guys like that and so i think i just got into a phase where i wanted to read more old ornate massive like structured novels and that's what i did for probably like two or three years and i'm still kind of in the back half of that like i just read bleak house and um and another Dickens, I can't remember, but like I chose Bleak because it's so big. <laughs> I think I also read like it, you know, like some like stuff I'd never even had an inkling of, and was like, I'm gonna read it by Stephen King. What what's that about? And yeah, I just got deep into that. So that was kind of that's been kind of my journey of the last five years, basically. So I I have to admit I will probably not follow your advice on that one because yeah. I have. <laughs> I, first of all, I read I read those for my PhD. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, but um, some of those, not all of them. But it's funny you say that because I need I need a sense of completion, and mm. so 
what drives yeah. what drives me crazy. So like I started reading short story anthologies about a year ago. And um, like I love reading anthologies of different writers because I get a different voice in my head every day. So I love mm -hmm. that idea of reading a short story, like the Best American Short Stories Anthology, which comes out oh, every okay. year. So you read one and then you read a second one that was totally different, like different style, different everything. And I love the idea of getting different voices in my head. Um, I don't like the idea of an extended voice over long. I mean, that's just me, a long period yeah, of yeah, time. Yeah, totally. But, but practically, uh, the problem with, you know, if I'm reading 30 minutes a day, then that could take me two months to read one of those books. And I just don't, I, I, it's funny. I'm fascinated by that because I don't want it to drag on. Um, but I love that you feel like you want to be in that world for as long as possible. That's so cool. I never <laughs> thought of it that way. Um, but you know what you should do? Here's what you should do next. Start reading the long, the classic poems. You got to go to Paradise Lost. Yeah, I have that. I, I've Sir, read that. Uh, yeah. Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Yeah, I've read that too. Yeah, yeah, I read a lot of that in college. Like some of the epic poems. Yeah, right. The epic poems. Uh, Lord it's Byron. It's been a while though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah um, totally. Uh, or Ivan. Have you read Ivanhoe? Uh, no, I've not read Ivanhoe. That's a yeah. good one. That's a good, that may not be as long as you want, but that's a good 400 pages. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, a, that's a big book. <laughs> uh, that's no, that's a book. It's a book. Um, but it, oh, yeah, reminds, right. that is a novel. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But it's that kind of that medieval and I love it. I think it's, yeah. I, I remember reading that. I love that. That's a long one. What about Middlemarch? Okay. Yeah. I, that was actually the second one that I hit after I hit, that was the third one. I think it started with one piece. Lay Miz, and then I hit Middle March, and that one started to kind of drag. I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna oh, make yeah. it. But then I hit the last quarter, and I was like, Oh, this is great. Somehow, I don't know. I, I think just... that's the only one that kind of drug on. To be honest, I've tried a few that I was like, I'm not into that. Sorry. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> See... Oh, yeah, because it's such a commitment. It's got to be something where I'm like, Oh, yeah, this is good, and I just want it to keep going. You know what I mean? And if yeah. it's not, I'm not into it. It's like I'm not gonna commit to like 700 pages or something. I'm not gonna like be into. It. Yeah. I finally started doing that. I was always the kind of right reader that would say, I've got to finish this no matter how bad yeah. it is. But I stopped doing that. Um, if you wanted me to read a more recent book, uh, Jennifer Egan's new book, Candy House. Um, oh, yeah. Is okay. Great. And okay. Uh, she wrote Visit Visit from the Goon Squad. I think that was yeah. what it was called. Yeah, yeah I read uh, that one. Yeah. yeah. Candy House is a it's a prequel okay. to that one. Oh, uh, um, yes, it's a prequel, I think. Yeah. Uh, that's right. She, that, that, that's, that's the one that's, a, yeah, that's right. That's the one that's about the music industry. Yeah. yeah. I remember that one. It's yeah, great. Totally. Um, mm -hmm. well that I'm glad we got that out of the way. Cause I was, I looked over the briefs and DJ pancake answer one, but I, I love the fact that you've gone totally different now. You're reading the exact opposite of that, but yeah, I, I am much more of a want to read it, new voice, get it out of the way. But I did follow your yeah. advice on the genres. I'll read. Uh, do you, do you know of Don Carpenter? No, but you mentioned that in our last interview, I think. Okay, I, he's another one that's like one of my top favorite writers who only wrote a few books. You should check out Blade of Light. I'm going to read that. I'm writing that down. Hard right to get now. your hands on, but it's a really good one. His biggest um, book is Hard Rain Falling, or Hard, Rain's, Hard Rain Falling is his most famous, but Blade of Light is his most succinct. Um, and his voice, I don't know, he just has a great voice. I don't think it's as like punchy in the gut as pancake but it's definitely extremely high quality <laughs> great <laughs> oh yeah um yeah because i do a fiction and a non-fiction book that's what i try to do at the same time yeah. um to get them get those different vo different voices in there so totally I, um, i'm actually reading murakami right now and not one of the big ones i did read uh what is it 1984 or iqa4 whatever but I'm reading Kafka on the Shore right now, and that's incredible. That's a good one. I don't know if you know that one. I, I've heard of it, but I've not read it. That's one author that I have a gap. I need to read some of his stuff because that's incredible. Yeah. And Murakami. One of my favorites. Songwriters always mention Murakami. I mean, you could imagine yeah. Murakami is always up there. Um, uh, Car Raymond Carver, we talked about that. Uh, you know, um, Cormac McCarthy, it's all kind of the same ones. Um, so the other question I have is, that last time we talked, you mentioned that you're you're still are a pen and paper person with lyrics, and you used a pen, that old Bic pen with like the four colors. You click each color, 
Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I still have the. Yeah, do you still yeah, have right that? Here, actually, I don't know. I have lately. I I'm not as much of a snob anymore. Now I just sort of use whatever. But I definitely like ballpoint. Prefer ballpoint. Yeah. Um, I had Jerry Harrison of the Talking Heads on a few months ago, and he said he has cool. likes a fault a felt tip pen because he loves the sensation of the scraping. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> and I lo- now he's a visual artist, so I think there's also that. But I love that idea. But so you're less particular because you mentioned very specifically you like that. Yeah, that I like black pen. ballpoint. Yeah, I like black ballpoint. Um, I think of that at that time I was probably still uh, like working on novels a lot. Yeah, and five so, at yeah, time. The old French four color was useful for that, yep. you know. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk about. I love the new album. By the way, I was listening to it yesterday. I, I really like it, and I'm. I want to make sure that I get this straight um, about the process. Um, what I found interesting was that you said a lot of lyrics came to you during meditation. Um, and, you know, other songwriters tell me that they meditate, but they actually use meditation as a way to make the songwriting process more effective later on. So that's 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 a way that they completely clear the head and it's the lyrics never come to them because they deliberately use that as a time so that they're more focused later on. But if I read that correctly, those lyrics are actually coming to you during those times. Is that right? Oftentimes I think that um, my writing process is so visual and pictorial in nature that I don't like, I don't get lyrics, but I'll get pictures like I, I work off of dreams a lot. Um, and for this record in particular, I kept a dream journal for about six months um, that at the same time that I was like really deep in to beginning this meditation practice. And so I think it has more to do with the visual aspect of those two things that I would later on turn into to lyrics or narratives or whatever. Um yeah, I wouldn't say I would. Get, I got lyrics when I'm meditating because, yeah, I, I'm sort of doing away with like the world of signs, you know, when I'm yeah. meditating. Um, but yeah, like the the visual imagery, I would say is probably what I meant. So, when you're when did you decide? Was it d- did you decide? Did you say you know I'm getting all these song ideas or all these ideas during dreams? I need to keep a journal. When did you decide, and how did you decide? I'm going to keep a dream journal, and this could be, you know, fruitful for songwriting. Well, I I had been reading Carl Jung a few years back, and had been sort of mulling about, mulling over in my mind, like his sort of grand theory of the subconscious, right? And I think I was realizing, like, oh, that whole structure that he talks about. That's how I wrote songs when I was young. Like I would sort of just free write subconscious kind of like thing, you know, and it was always very surreal and kind of dreamlike anyway. And so I was, I was like, you know, I want to tap back into that. Um, I'm going to keep a dream journal. And so then I started actually reading dreams by Carl Jung to sort of see how he did it. Um, Cause he has that, I don't know if you've read that book where he just, he it's incredible he has a colleague who's younger like it's almost like he's like hey you let's do this thing tell me your dream that you have every night every day tell it to me i'm gonna write it down and analyze it and there's like i think there's like over 300 entries it's insane and you can just read them back to back and he gets deep into crazy al- al- alchemical stuff it's insane drawings and geometry it's really fun and so i read that and was just like oh man i gotta try this you know um, so that was kind of the beginning of it was, was that. So um, four song ideas. So, so was, was yeah. that the, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For song ideas. And just to sort of like delve into my own subconscious and sort of see what kind of imagery I could pull out of that, you know? Um, yeah. Because his, you know, his whole idea is that, that the actual motivation for our actions originates in that subconscious realm and the only way to access it to according to him is through your dreams now i would say that there are other ways and i think that 
very specific forms of meditation can also take you there. Probably psychedelic drugs too, I would imagine can sort of take you there. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the, that was sort of his gateway. And so I wanted to just try it and see what it felt like. <laughs> So are you, are you often, were you ever waking up in the middle of the night and writing these things down or were you, were you always waiting until the next morning? No, I was, once I got in the swing, every morning I could get up and remember and write oh, it Oh, really? Down. Yeah. Did you read Homeland Elegies by mm-hmm. Ayad Akhtar? Yeah. No, no. It won the, it won the, uh, I think it won. Yeah. I know that name. The okay. Pulitzer. Did it win the Pulitzer Prize? Yes. It, no, he won the Pulitzer Prize for his, for Disgraced. So I had Akhtar, El- okay. Homeland Elegies. It's a great novel. Anyway, the character in the book, you'll appreciate this. Um, he's a writer, and to write down his dreams, what he would do is he would <laughs> he would tape a pencil to his finger oh, yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the night so he could wake up. So he because his therapist told him that if he waited till the morning, and if he waited even two like with every passing second the dream was disappearing so you mm. had to write it so in the middle of the night so we'd always <laughs> have it handy so he actually taped it to his finger Dang, um that's serious business i know right <laughs> uh, i don't it was it's a horrible idea by the way i mean you'll you'll lose yeah, right. your eyes within like a week yeah. um <laughs> but i haven't mentioned this in a while uh this this um there's a study that was done i read about this in scientific american and it was uh, it's this idea that we get our best ideas not in sleep and not in wake in the waking moment, but there's that period and there's a name for it between when you go to bed, you're not quite asleep and you're in, in that haze. Mm-hmm. And so the study actually was involved. Um, they did this with people in the lab, but this is what Salvador Dali would do. Um, mm-hmm. He would he would sit, there's a picture of him. He would sit in this incredibly uncomfortable chair and he would have a skeleton key in his outstretched hands and he'd have a saucer on the floor underneath it. So he would fall asleep. His key, the key would drop, it would wake him up and then he'd start to paint. Um, because he said it was that in that hazy moment where, you know, you're somewhat, you're not unconscious, but you're not conscious. And they found that that to be an especially productive time for creative types. Um, So I wonder if that's ever, I know that's not dreaming, that's different, but is that ever, have you ever gotten ideas in that space too? And be like, oh yeah, that, that, that melody or that lyric, what a weird, it's like this weird moment. Yeah. I mean, probably, I think the meditative state sort of is that in a lot of ways, or it can be. Um, But yeah, that's cool. That's a cool thing that Salvador Dali did. Yeah, that was a picture of him. It's great. And he said, like, he that's what he was doing. Yep, that's the picture. And he and it drops and then it wakes now him I'm up. I'm going to try that because I always want to try that stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, right. I'll get I'll get you to study somehow. It's it's really <laughs> cool. But they've actually done they actually somehow did this with people in the lab and they found that, you know, I guess when they woke them up or whenever they, you know, they have them hooked up and they know when their mind is in that state. Um, OK, so you. So the lyrics that in the dream journal, then, so you're just, are, are you, when you get up in the morning, are you writing a certain number of pages or is it just, just right until you're just the well, the tank is empty? Uh, no, I was just, I would write um, all, all memories of the dream. And then I would try to explain it to myself in some sense. And I would draw pictures with it and then I would free write. Okay. And then is that, are the lyrics coming from that or is that separate? Yeah. It's coming from all of it. The imagery. Okay. Yeah. But then you would look at, you would look at that, at that dream journal and they'd free write. And then after the free writing comes the lyrics. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that it was that like, I didn't really have a setup. I was just sort of utilizing that. And this is the other thing is that I, I read Buddhist sutras like every day. Like, yeah all the time of all stripes because there's lots of different schools and so i was also doing that really heavily and so i think that that reading also started to enter into my dreams and started to sort of shape my subconscious and i think and and the thing with the buddhist sutras which most people don't like they're not highly read they're not read by a lot of people even people that practice buddhist meditation types they're they're a very strange 
au revoir of literature. All right. And so, you know, there's a lot of thoughts about the sutras. I, I've heard uh, sutra teachers who, who like, you know, know Sanskrit, know Pali, know all the ancient languages. And they're like, I'm pretty sure that these scriptures do like they re or they like they restructure your brain. Like, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that's what these are for. They were oral for hundreds of years and then they started to write them down. And so when you speak them out loud or portions of them, there's this theory that it actually changes your brain, like rewires it. And so I think that that also kind of comes into play or came into play when I was writing the record, because I was really starting to go deep into that at the same time that I was keeping this dream journal. Um, but yeah, the interplay, I don't know. Cause like a lot of the stories and, or a lot of the ideas in the songs come from the, that um, cosmology of the sutras. Um, and so I think that, yeah, it all was kind of like playing together in this weird way for me at that time. With those lyrics on the album, did you do a lot of revising to them or did you not revise them because of where they came from? Yeah, some I didn't revise at all. Yeah. Really? Yeah, just because I wanted... I, I guess just because like I wouldn't know, like, why would you? Like, I, maybe I did some revising in terms of just the the sound of the words together, but not in terms of like, I want to make this more coherent or something, you know, and that's not all the songs. Um, but yeah, probably half the record is like that where I was just sort of pulling from this subconscious store and then just letting it be. Yeah. And maybe those are the ones that you feel like from where it came, it came from there. So I shouldn't be messing with it. Yeah. Like if I like it, then yeah, why would I mess with it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I also wanted to ask you about, so from what I understand, you found tapes that you made when you were, I think, 19 or 20, right? Well, I have a box of cassette tapes. They're all four track cassette tapes. Yeah. That's, yeah, that start when I was 19, you know, it, it starts back in like 95 or so when I got a four track. Yeah. And it sort of is just chronic. I mean, there's probably 50, 60 tapes. I don't know. And it chron it basically chronicles all my songwriting and recording from the age of 19 all the way to probably 30. And so. See, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I, I was just going through them. I borrowed a four track from a friend and was just kind of listening and going through and found a couple, a few songs that I was like, oh man, I'm going to pull this out, rework it a little bit and and see what happens one of them i i kept the original acoustic guitar tracks from that old four track from probably you know 2000 1999 maybe i don't know something like that um so that's kind of fun see what, what, uh, what surprises me is i don't think i can i have some of those things now, i'm a prose writer not a songwriter but i kept some of my things from when i was a teenager or college I don't look at any of that stuff and say, wow, that's good. It's always mortification of, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote that. So I'm impressed that you <laughs> that you listened to those things back that you made back then and you thought, wow, that's pretty good. Um, but and then you so you would pair then some of that music with the lyrics, right? That that you wrote. So how do you even how did you decide even what goes with what? I I th that fascinates me. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't, I, I think one of the things with songwriting that's, that's makes it fun and easy sometimes is that I don't, I didn't really have to, I, I don't really put a lot of thought, forethought into what I'm doing, you know? Um, I just sort of like, I'm pulling things and putting it together and being like, oh yeah, I like this or, oh, I don't like that. And not really like, clinging to anything you know and so i think what it was what happened with a few songs in particular is i pulled them from a really old store of songs like yeah for when i'm a kid basically 19 or whatever and i'm like oh this whatever, whatever i was doing at that time this guitar part and everything means something to me now and these lyrics mean something to me now 
but I'm going to tweak them a little bit because I was 19 when I wrote them, you know? <laughs> uh, and so with a song that's only two and a half minutes long, you can do that. You know, you can go in and like just dissect a little here, a little there. And you're like, all right, this is, this is what I want it to be now, you know, regardless of what I was trying to do at 19. Um, yeah. I don't know that I could make a whole record based on like pulling those old songs and reworking them. That I think that that would be, I don't think there would be a point to that necessarily, but I do feel good about pulling some of those because in the last few years, I feel like I've returned to a way of songwriting that I was doing at that age, 19, 20. Um, How and so? so if, um, I think, you know, at that point, I was still really writing for nobody but me with no real thought for an audience. And I was also really just naturally writing from a place of detachment and a place um, very seated in the subconscious because I was so into sort of those, the kind of surrealist songwriters of that time, like Michael Stipe, Stephen Malcolmist, you know, like the, what I would call surrealists of the nineties. Um, and so that was just kind of my, that's what I, that's what I liked. That's what I did, you know? And I, and I think recent, more recently I've returned to that way of writing and that kind of writing where the lyrics are more obtuse, more from the subconscious, um, have some narrative quality, but not quite as much. And I, I feel like if you write out back to what we were saying, I feel like you were, if you revise lyrics that came from the sub subconscious, that completely ruins it. That defeats the whole purpose of it. Right. It can. Yeah. It depends if you're writing a song and the whole idea for the song comes from that place, there's room within it to work. But if you're writing line by line, I think, um, then yeah, it's like, if each line feels perfect and it's coming from that place, then you just roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to read you some quotes here. I have some quotes from some songwriters and from some writers. So I want to, this actually first one is from, is from David Byrne. Uh, and he says, a car is a good place to write lyrics. Driving occupies one part of the brain, freeing up the other. Um, and I have that conversation all the time with songwriters and, and I read this, you know, writers too, that the best ideas come to them when they are performing some kind of activity that requires no conscious thought. So this ranges from driving to gardening, to folding laundry, to vacuuming, to cooking. Uh, and that our best ideas come to us when they're not trying to think of those ideas. So how often does that happen to you when those eureka moments come at those times? And and I, so my, I guess part of that is there may you may be doing something that actually has some rhythm to it. Um, I've talked to songwriters who get song who've gotten melody ideas from turn signals and car alarms. That's a little different, mm -hmm. but because that's an active sound that they hear. But I'm fascinated about those moments of when those ideas come to us. So anyway, that's a long way of asking that question. Yeah, I mean, it's possible that every idea occurs that way because i'm not the kind of person that like sits down and like i'm gonna write a song uh i don't think i've ever really done that i always am just doing some something and it strikes me you know and i can be doing things to sort of facilitate that throughout my days you know whether it's you know reading this or that or meditating or or whatever you know walking through the woods but yeah, when the ideas actually come, I think you're right. I think it's like you're just washing dishes or pulling weeds and then you're like, oh yeah. But you don't remember that because you're doing something that's menial. You know, you don't, you don't right. think about it. But if I really think about it, it's like, yeah, that's actually when the ideas come. It's like you're driving your car, you're washing it. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably yeah. when they all, that's probably when they all come. That would be my guess. Well, I remember when I was in college studying mathematics and there would be problems that we would work on for weeks at a time. This was in some of the advanced courses. And yeah, you'd be working on a problem and then you'd go and you'd be like making your breakfast and then you'd be like, oh crap. And you just drop it all and like go, go find a pencil or whatever. <laughs> I think it's the same thing. There's a great book. Speaking of another book, all these tomes, uh, the romantic poets. 
they got some definitely have some tomes, some of those yeah. those long poems. <laughs> they do. Um and um they're yeah, what a Blake, like any of those William Blake, I mean those old ones. Um mm-hmm. there's an article, there's a book called The Friendship by Adam Sisman. It's about the friendship between Wordsworth and Coleridge. And they found both of those guys composed all of their poems on walks. And um, one of them needed flat terrain, the other one needed rocky terrain. But Wordsworth had such a great memory, he would compose and edit his poems in his mind on his walks and wouldn't come back until it was fully formed. But but uh, but back then, there's nothing else to do. What did they do? They just walked all day. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting that, that those ideas were coming again when you're just kind of engaged in those activities. It's almost like you need to be doing something you've done a million times. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't think if you're driving in an unfamiliar place, that would work. Right. Here's another one for you. This is from E.L. Doctorow. He says, writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as the headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. So as a prose writer, when I start writing, I don't think I have any right knowing what it's supposed to look like at the end. To me, that's the biggest mistake you can make is saying, and that's just me saying, I'm here, I want to get there, here's how I'm going to get there. I think that limits, you know, the diversions, the detours your mind can take. So I'm curious, uh, and I think I I know the answer to this, because you said how you rarely sit down with an idea of what to write about, but I'm guessing that kind of holds true, that you can only see, you know, with that quote, right, that you don't sit down and say, here is where I want to be when I start to write. Yeah, I think I really, I I think that probably hits on what I enjoy most about writing of any kind is that, that weird maze you go through of like here and there and everywhere. I think that's the part I actually like about it. If there weren't that maze of unknowing, I don't think it would interest me because I think my personality just likes the unknown and constant change. And I have seen that throughout my life. And so I think in writing, you can, I, I can get there really easily. Just you start writing and it just leads you. And <laughs> that's a great quote. But when we talked last time, I think you had said that you're all like, I asked you, I think if, if you sit down, you know, if you write every day and you said something like you, you're always writing, you're, you never, ever lack for things to write about. Um, so But that's different to me than like having the urge to write. Like sometimes you just feel like you have the urge if something happened or you have to write about something. Mm -hmm. I'm not guessing you have the urge to write because it sounds like when we talked last time, you were just, you're always writing. You're never lacking for something to write about. I think it depends on the season of life. Like at that time when I talked to you, I was still not working all the time. Like when I was just touring for a living, yeah, I was writing literally all the time, whether it was novels or song. But now that I'm like running a couple of different programs at the, my job and like yeah. got a kid and stuff, it's changed that dynamic for me. Like I'm not always writing, you know, it's like, I, I honestly, I'm not writing much at all anymore. I'm really just um, writing songs when. I allow myself to sort of do that. You know what I mean? Like I can want to write songs and keep myself from it because like, why should I? I've written a million songs in my life. But if I want to let myself go there, yeah, it's just very easy for me to go there and just start writing all the time, you know? And I I have started writing again on a sub stack um, just like... At this point in my life, I have so many odd, weird stories from tours and from all kinds of things that I've just sort of started um, writing a lot of those stories and they all kind of intertwine in different ways. And a lot of it is, um, I sort of, a lot of it I sort of am, am setting next to a lot of the Buddhist um, ideas that I'm interested in and sort of letting them all have free play together. Um, but that's really the kind of the only writing I'm doing right now. Um, but the last time that we talked, yeah, I was probably still in a, in a season where I was just writing all the time because I could. Right. Do you find we have, we have four kids, uh, and I find that having kids makes me much more disciplined because you don't have all day. 
you got short windows, right? Small windows of time. So has has that made you a more disciplined writer? Yeah, probably if well, it's hard to say. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, not really. I don't think that it I, I don't know. I think that have I mean, I had a kid at 40, right? So like I'd already passed through this 20 year period where I was just writing obsessively compulsively all the time. And I was starting to kind of come out of this period and realize that there were parts of that that were very unhealthy for me on a personal level. And it kind of coincided with having my daughter. And so it's, it's, almost, it's almost like there was just this huge shift that happened. And so I don't really, I don't think that I really look at writing in the same way I did the last time we talked for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and also my work that I do is so intense emotionally and it's so kind of all consuming a lot of the times, but at the same time, it is just jam packed with narrative. Like, I mean, <laughs> like if I were to document everything that I've experienced in the last five years working this work, I mean, you could write 10 novels. Like it's insane. The stuff that happens and like we, I, and I just kind of let it go because it sucks. It's just it's like too much for someone like me who has for years written everything that's gone on. And so I don't know, I'm in this weird place where I think I'm just like really living my life as opposed to documenting it, which is what I did for so long through songs and novels. And, and yeah, now it just feels like I'm just kind of like in it, you know, I don't know. I, it's hard to explain. Does that make any sense? It, it does. And it makes me think about the difference between the desire to write and the need to write. I mean, yeah. you can you can want to write, but you don't need to. Um, you know, and and sometimes people have this obsession of I have to, I have to write every day. I have to, I have to, I can't. You know, I I, I it's got to be a part of my day, and that's not the same as oh, there's something I really want to write about. Um, so it, I'm guessing you're referring to the work with the homeless population, right? There yeah. is that. Yeah. Okay, so because I'd read about this also, and I have a great quote by James Baldwin. I want to read to you and oh, get cool. your get your take on. Um, so he says, one writes out of one thing only, one's own experience. Everything depends on how relentlessly one forces from this experience the last drop, sweet or bitter, it can possibly give. How does that experience working with the homeless population, is it a part of your songwriting? Or is that a se the separate type of writing that you're doing? No, I, I think it has become... I think that it's weaseled its way in, <laughs> in different ways that I'm not fully aware of until after the fact. Um, I think doing that work for the last five, six years has changed me as a person in ways that I, I'm still sort of figuring out, you know? Yeah. I think, I think that I was, I, I had this pretty, um, elevated, um, ability for detachment i would say i had attach i have had attachment issues my whole life and so it allowed me to do that work without burning out for quite some time but it also did the opposite it doing that work sort of started to help awaken this um attachment in me and caused me to realize certain things and has, and has changed me in all these ways to be honest <laughs> Because I just fell into the work. I didn't choose to do it. I mean, I did, but not really. It was like I needed some extra cash, and a buddy of mine was working just like the night shift at a veteran's shelter, seven to seven. And, and I was like, oh, that sounds cool. I can just like write and watch TV and like hang out while they're, they're sleeping or whatever. But that's not what it ended up being. It ended up being insane. And <clears throat> so I kind of just had selfish motives from the beginning, <laughs> you know, just like, oh, this will be easy. Just hang out with some homeless people. Uh, but it turned into something so completely different. And it has evolved into something so different than what it initially felt like and was. Um, so there's no way that those experiences have not worked themselves into the music I've been writing. Um, 
and and I would say into who I actually am as a human at this point in time. <laughs> Uh, last question. I'm going to give you one more quote. This is from H.L. Mencken. The value of writing seems to be an inverse proportion to the ease of writing. Whatever flows freely and bubblingly turns out to be sorry stuff a week later. Uh, <laughs> so do you trust the, the do you trust the stuff that comes out easily or does that or are you skeptical of of those words? Um, I think when it comes to songs, I usually trust what immediately comes out. Yeah. When it comes to writing stories, no, not at all. Yeah. I think that's the main difference between the two, because I think that music, I don't know, there's just something different about it. There's something so much more primitive about it, I think. Um just because you're dealing with sounds yeah that go into your ear hole you know and writing is different i would say writing is more comp complex like writing novels or reading them or whatever you know mu music is so much more just it's about your body hmm. and a lot of times because i'm writing music that have lyrics but also have sounds my main thing is that i want the sounds and the language to completely and utterly entwine in the energy and the feeling that they give off, right? So like the chord run, the melody, the instruments I'm using, I want those to give you the same feeling as that lyric, as that, you know, picture that you're creating with words. And so there's a sort of, you kind of have to keep it primitive in certain ways almost because you're dealing with sounds, you know? I don't know if you've ever read uh, All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, that's a great book. And when he talks about the peaches and the the, mm -hmm. the 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 wedges of peaches for breakfast, he calls them wedges of wet sunlight. Yeah, that, I remember that exactly. That do you remember that line? Oh, why yeah. do we? Re oh, I, yeah. I mean, is why do we remember? That's still one of my favorite lines ever. Wedges. I think about the the alliteration. Wedges wet, and then mm -hmm. wet sunlight. The 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 terminal T. The initial W's. Wedges of wet sunlight. There's everything in those four words mm -hmm. that is to me one of the best images I've ever read. Um, yeah, it's like it encapsulates all of life. It does. All of life comes from the sun. And so, yeah, to me, he, I love, that's a great book. And that line in particular, I also remember. And, and I think it's because it's one of those lines that encapsulates the entirety of existence somehow, because it's the sun, it's a material object that is made of energy. The sun, like it's just, it, it makes your mind sort of expand out and you're like, oh, oh, that's right. Everything is the same. Right. One, one movement of a brush stroke, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm lacking, I'm forgetting the term, but wet sunlight is oxymoronic. I mean, that's not the literary or is, term. Or, or is it? I mean, yeah, but like, wet lights, like wet, yeah. everything. I know. I, I'm so glad you remember that too, because, oh my gosh, that line blew me away. Um, wet sunlight. I mean, well, and, light and, is... and it's the blind girl who actually says that. Yes. So she's never seen yeah. what she's talking about. Yeah. But she's talking about it in semi-visual terms. It, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's, that's an incredible line that he came up with in the context of that book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that story. And that's it for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget my book, Desolation, a heavy metal memoir by Mark Morton with Ben Opapari, that is me, comes out June 25th on Hachette Books. Mark is a good friend of mine. He is one of the guitarists in the band Lamb of God, and this is his memoir. Uh, it's a damn good book, if I do say so myself. But again, that book is out June 25th on Hachette Books. You can pre-order it now everywhere, your favorite online bookstore. So be sure to do that. The site, Songwriters on Podcast, contains all of the archived episodes of the podcast. Of course, you can find them on all streaming platforms as well, but they're also on the site. Uh, I only have had the podcast for about 
uh, I don't think even two years before that, all of the all of the interviews were transcribed, and that took a lot of work. And that's why I started the podcast. So if you want to read the interviews that I did before the podcast, they are on Songwriters on Podcast as well. There are about 200 of them going back to 2010. So check those out. If you want to get a hold of me, Ben at songwritersonprocess.com or fill out a form on the website. I'm here for your questions, your complaints, your concerns, or your interview suggestions. I'd love getting those as well. So hit me up. I will try to respond. So that's it, everyone. Have a great day and see you next time.